Good afternoon. My name is Jason Robinson. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and today I'm joining you from Opelika, Alabama, here at Southern Union State Community College. That's a community college in Opelika, Alabama, which is really close to Auburn, Alabama. Most of you have probably heard of that. So this is a wonderful training facility. Um, there's a community college with lots of other programs going on, going on here. There's a plastics program here. Um, it's a two-year degree program, and we are using their lab, and we partner with each other, and we're conducting Master Molder 1, Master Molder 2 classes, fundamentals of systematic molding, a couple workshop, um, and any of the other classes, like uh, part design, mold design. We have classrooms to do train the trainer classes and all of that. So take advantage of this if you're in the area. Nice weather all year round. So today we're going to focus on back pressure. So back pressure can be, it's one of those settings that we copy off of a setup sheet or maybe we just go up to a machine and type in a number. Um, and I believe it's misunderstood lots of times. So let's talk about what the purpose of back pressure is. Maybe some of the things that it has been used for, um, it, it cur I'm including my past. Um, and let's just try to the waters on what back pressure is. So back pressure, to, to tell you what back pressure is, so on, on a molding machine, um, this is an electric molding machine, um, functions slightly different on a hydraulic, but the result on the plastic is the same. So as this shibora right here, when it recovers, and you can hear it right, right now it's recovering, so as it's recovering, it is metering plastic in front of the non-return valve, the plastic pressure in front of the screw tip is trying to drive the screw back to the shot size setting. So as it's doing that on this electric machine, what the machine does is it provides a braking action to try to resist that screw moving to the desired shot size. On a hydraulic machine, same thing in the screw, it tries to recover back to shot size, but as the screw moves, it pushes a cylinder back and there's oil behind that cylinder. So in the hydraulic line for that oil, there's a restriction and you set it at some hydraulic pressure. So then let's just say you have 500 uh, PSI hydraulic back pressure setting, then you use the intensification ratio and that transfers to a specific pressure of the melt in the barrel. The electric does this, achieves the same higher melt pressure in the barrel, but through a braking action. So if we wanna move the screw from cushion back to shot size to, to make the next part, why do we wanna resist it? It almost seems counterintuitive. Let me tell you why we actually have that setting on the machine and why we use it. So if we take back pressure off, just put zero on there, you'll see that the screw recovers really fast. And, but if you start looking at your parts, you'll see a couple things. One is the cushion will be fluctuating up and down. And a lot of times we as molders will monitor the cushion from the machine side as a uh, output of, of the process, how it's set up. We want it to be fairly consistent. Um, the other thing, if you actually start looking at the parts, um, if you're making short shots or fill onlys intentionally, and you're using, so let's just say zero back pressure at this point, you're gonna see inconsistencies in that fill only shot, okay? So what the, what the back pressure does, that resistance, it, it provides consistency to that melted pool of plastic in front of the non-return valve. So if we can, what we do is we're providing resistance and that's compressing the density of the plastic that we put in there. So it makes a, a consistent density that we're gonna shoot into the mold. When we have too low of a back pressure, that density goes way down and then eventually it gets inconsistent shot after shot after shot. Um, so let's just say you have enough back pressure and then you raise the back pressure, but that's all you change. So what, what actually happens is the screw is going to recover to the same linear position, but the amount of plastic in front of the check ring or non-return valve will be more. It'll be more dense so that it, if you weighted it, it would weigh a bit more. So there in turn, when you shoot that shot into the mold, you're actually putting more plastic into the mold with the same exact shot size and transfer position. So, so we only need enough back, back to get consistency. So, so far we've talked about shot to shot consistency. There's another form of consistency that back pressure helps us with. It actually helps mix material. So it, if with a lower back pressure, the screw rotates less revolutions to achieve the shot size. A little bit higher back pressure, it'll, re, it'll 
it will d achieve more revolutions. And that allows the geometry of the screw to actually mix in the color. All right, so the purpose is just enough back pressure to have consistent color mixing and consistent shot to shot uh, fill only parts. So let's talk about some of the things that I've done in my past and maybe you've seen this on your production floor. So a long time ago, I was, I was taught, this is back in my early days before I had any formal training, that if I had wet material, so I had silver streaks or splay in my parts, okay? And I was told by someone that, you know, if you do that and you wanna fix it really quick, just raise the back pressure. So what that does is it kind of starts driving the moisture back out through the feed throat. The most common form of splay is moisture in the material. So you got two options there. You can either shut the machine off, let the material dry properly in the dryer with a moisture analyzer before you run it to the machine, or if you're in a hurry, you want to fix it right then, you crank up the back pressure. So that's going to drive some of the moisture out, and that may make your parts look like look good, no splay. Everyone's happy. But what you did that maybe you weren't aware of is you're actually putting more material into the mold. So that's the same effect as raising maybe shot size, a couple millimeters, two, three millimeters. Would you raise the shot size to get rid of splay? No. So yes, initially a quick setting to change and get rid of splay is raising the back pressure, but then you're putting more material in the mold. In the mold. Maybe now your parts are oversized. Maybe you're flashing. So then you gotta go adjust something else to compensate for that. So it compounds and you end up maybe getting lost or confused and it muddles the true issue. The true issue was the material wasn't dry. So I'm gonna tell him myself right now. Back in those days, long time ago, I had a glass filled nylon part, had splay. I went and checked the dryer and it was on, it was set right, but I knew it wasn't in there long enough. It was only in there like an hour and a half. So I did the trick I just told you. I raised the back pressure up from around 500 PSI specific to about 1500 PSI specific. Cold runner mold, so I caught the part, looked at it, after about five or six shots, that, that splay was gone and I was happy. So I had a million other things to do. So I started the leave and next thing you know, before I got 10 feet away, the machine had a clamp arm. I looked, fired it back up, ran it a few more times and I saw that when the mold opened, the nice pretty non-splay part, over here it was drooling plastic out of the sprue bushing. So I'm like, hmm, what, what have I been told that makes the makes a nylon like that stop drilling. And I remember someone else had told me that decompression can fix that. So here's what happened. When I went from 500 PSI to 1500 PSI specific back pressure, I was compressing more material in there. So then my decompress setting, there's a clue to what decompress does in the name, that decompress that I had, it wasn't enough distance to decompress the melt. So when I opened the mold, it wanted to go somewhere. It went out in the mold. So then I, I know how to fix that, I'll raise decompression. So I raised it up from like five or six millimeters to like 20 millimeters. And I waited a few cycles and the stringing quit, the drooling quit, so it would cycle, no more clamp arms. I went to break, quality person calls me, said, hey Jason, you got splay back on this part. Looked at him, sure enough, there's splay. Well, on some materials and some machines, when you decompress or suck the screw back too far, you draw moisture or air in through the seat between the nozzle and the sprue bushing. So then there went my splay again. So I don't remember, but I guarantee you, I probably what I did, I went to the back pressure again to raise it up some more. I did that, that, I did that circle at least twice. So time out. The issue was wet material. I had a quick fix for back pressure to raise it up, but then that compounded into something else. So that's not the way to troubleshoot. Back pressure is not meant for that. We have a dryer to solve that, that issue, right? And a moisture analyzer to check it to make sure it's dry enough. Um, some other things that I've done, and I've, I've been around people doing training and consulting, you have a little bit of a short shot. Oh, I'm going to raise the back pressure up because that makes the short shot go away. And it does. It sure enough does. Um, and sometimes we think that's because we're making the material hotter. Well, here's the thing. When you change temperatures, 
on a, on a barrel of a molding machine, however you do it, that takes time. Take, it doesn't happen instantly. It's a gradual increase. So if you raise the back pressure up and you got a tiny short shot, if it's going to go away, it'll do it really quick within two or three shots. So are, are we really making the material hotter? I'm going to tell you that we have instrumentation in this mold right here. We have a thermocouple in, in the mold reading, reading the, not the exact melt temperature, but if we raise, if we actually make the plastic hotter or colder, we can see the thermocouple in the mold reflect that. And when you raise the back pressure up, most of the time there's a minimal increase in temperature. And it's not always even temporary. It's, it's not permanent. It's a temporary increase, and it's a small one. So why does raising the back pressure make that little tiny short shot go away. We're putting more material in the barrel, right? We're compressing in the same linear distance, shot size, we're compressing that plastic more. So now there's actually more plastic that we're putting in the mold. Well, a simpler way to do that is to, there's a setting to put more material in the mold and that's called shot size. So back pressure is a kind of a mysterious setting that a lot of people don't really understand the purpose of it. And if you understand the purpose of it, you're going to use it uh, more appropriately. So we coach people that when your process engineer or whoever develops the process initially, um, a back pressure is established. And as long as that's, you know, the adequate back pressure and things are consistent, that should be at the very bottom of your list of things to change to fix whatever problem you're encountering that day. Um, Usually it is just muddling the issue that you're trying to uncover, that you're trying to, to uh, solve the root cause of. So we coach you to not really adjust back pressure. Now, now color mixing. If you do have color mixing issues, there is a range of um, acceptable back pressures that work in most cases. Nothing's absolute in every case. And if you do have color mixing issues, that color issue should be maybe it should be addressed at the initial development so you could have this back pressure okay and this back pressure okay but if this one mixes the color and this one don't you should establish the back pressure at this higher within range setting that way on a day-to-day -day basis we don't have to jack around with the back pressure to make the color mix better right and on the color issue if you do have really hardcore color mixing issues there are better approaches. So a mixing screw, um, get with your material supplier and your screw supplier and make sure you get the right kind of mixing screw. Another angle that you can approach color mixing issues is to go to the color, color supplier and sometimes they can change the formulation of color to make it disperse better in the barrel. And that is a, usually a rock solid fix where you're not tinkering with machine settings every other run just to get it to mix because it mix a lot better. Um, and then also pre-colored material. Everyone loves pre-colored material, but there's lots of reasons why we don't do that all the time. It's expensive and then you have inventory. So another topic. Um, another re reason, oh, so where would back pressure be set? So if you look at most supplier, uh, material supplier processing guides, if they have back pressure on, what they're gonna tell you and what we as RJG would recommend would be somewhere between 500 and 1000 PSI specific. So if you remember from earlier videos, or if you've taken our classes, when we say specific pressure, we're referring to the pressure in the barrel in front of the screw tip, okay? So with an electric machine, you would just set your back pressure on the controller 500 to 1,000. On a hydraulic machine, um, you would set it at the appropriate hydraulic pressure multiplied by the intensification ratio to give you 500 to 1,000 specific in the barrel. In most cases, that works. Um, on, uh, in the exceptions where you're not absolutely in 500 to 1,000, it's not too far off below 500 or above 1,000. If you're in a situation where you can't get things consistent at 1,000 or 1,100 or so, and you have to go up to two, 3,000 PSI, most of the time you're doing that, you're band-aiding that might be, it might be a worn check ring. Um, it might be the wrong design screw for what you're trying to do here. So again, if you go too far past the, the upper limit of 1,000 PSI specific, you've got to question, what am I overcoming? What am I, wh what am I providing a crutch to? It may be, um, maybe it might be the screw with a check ring. Or, um, so you've got to ask yourself, though. So 
root cause analysis is what we really should be focusing on when we're at the on the molding floor. Uh, that takes more time, and I know we get rushed um, when we got all these fires to put out. You got to try to always push towards let's find what's really wrong and stay away from the quick easy fixes. All right, so I'm running this bolt right here, and right now I have 500 psi of uh, back pressure on there. So here's the part. Right now, so I got some cavity pressure instrumentation on this little ice scraper mold. Got post gate in the fill sensors. Got a red thermocouple. So I'm going to raise the back pressure up by a thousand, or by from 500 to 1500. All right, I got it set at 1500. So parts are full, they look, they look good. So let's just see what happens. So I can point out a few differences on the cavity pressure curves and just from the machine outputs. So right away, my recovery time, my charge time is 1.51 seconds at the 500 PSI back pressure. Cushion is about 0.085 inches okay so now it's making the second part with the 1500 psi back pressure so right away my charge time or my plasticizing time went from 1.5 to 1.7 seconds so modest increase because i'm resisting the recovery of the screw more and now my cushion went from 0.085 inches to 0.12 inches so that's a fairly a significant increase in my cushion. So let's look at the part. You know, it still looks the same. You know why? Because it's packed out. There's probably a weight difference between the previous 500 PSI back pressure part and this 1,500 PSI back pressure part. See what I see on the e-dart over here. So the peak cavity pressures, there's probably eight sensors in that two cavity mold. All, all eight of those sensors have went up by about 500 PSI in the cavity. And you're probably wondering, all right, if they look the same, what does 500 PSI in the cavity mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It may not make the part bad, but it's going to make it slightly bigger. Okay, so increased cavity pressure, increased part weight generally leads to dimensions being bigger. In ABS, it's probably not significant, but in a more crystalline material, or in a crystalline material, it would be significant, okay? So let me show you another way to look at that. I'm gonna put the back pressure back at 500. All right, I got it set at 500. I'm gonna clean my bin out right here. Now I'm gonna turn my hole pressure off. So when I turn the hold pressure off, I'm making what we call a fill only part. So now I'm only filling, the hold pressure is off, so I'm not packing and I'm not holding, right? See my graph, I got short shots over there. All right, so I lower my back pressure, I got my back pressure at 500 PSI, back where it was originally, but all I did was turn the hold pressure off. So I'm making a fill only part, um, I don't know how well you can see it, but I got two short shots right there. All right, so when you decouple the process like this, which is what I just did, I got rid of the hole, so I decoupled it from the fill. Now you can see that change in back pressure a lot more. So here's a 500 PSI. I'm gonna put, put it back to 1500 PSI. Some of you may be thinking 500 to 1500, that's a pretty, extreme example and it is but i've seen worse in real real environments but i'm doing it to prove a point so you can actually see the differences how much more plastic it's going to put in the mold so that shot right there is recovering with the higher back pressure 1500 specific pressure so i'm going to let it run two or three shots like that and i'm going to show you what the parts look like okay so just so you know, I'm not pulling a fast one on you. Here's the parts out of the machine. I'm going to take these off. Now these are significantly fuller than, than these. So let me see if I can show you. 
do one of each. So these are at 1500 PSI back pressure. These are at 500 PSI back pressure. See the difference right there. Now I know that all washes out when you put hold on, but you got to think of it like this. If I put the same hold pressure back on with this much back pressure, now I'm filling it further when I start the pack and hold phase. So now I'm filling it different and that's going to cascade over to the pack and hold. Now I'm packing it differently. I'm not saying this is bad or better than this, but here's what it is. This is different than this. So let's just say I had splay or I had an inconsistent cushion and I was running the 500 PSI back pressure and I raised it to 1500. Now I'm feeling it this way. And if I never turned the hold pressure off or decoupled, I would not know. But it might come back to get me later. So maybe now the parts are out of spec. So that's going to get caught when at the final inspection, uh, maybe two hours when the quality audit's done. We'd, I don't know. It depends on where you're at. But the main point is, this is the difference between 500 PSI back pressure, 500 PSI back pressure, and 1500 PSI back pressure. So think about back pressure. Remember this video. So the next time you're changing or you want to change back pressure to fix some little pesky uh, defect or some quality issue or some inconsistency on the machine, um, think about it. Are you band-aiding something wrong? Are you band-aiding wet material, a worn screw, a worn check ring, maybe a worn barrel? Um, and or color issue. Now, if you maybe maybe in the initial process development, the back pressure was established a little bit on the low side, and you do find that you know things are overall better with the maybe with a thousand instead of five hundred. That's where you go back and you requalify the tool, you requalify the process, you PPAP it or whatever it is you're doing, um, whether you're in automotive or or medical. You get it done the right way and let all the checks be done, let the, the CPKs be done, make sure it's repeatable, make sure it's in spec, make sure production buys off on it, quality buys off on it. You just don't want to do it wild west and walk away because you're doing things that you can't necessarily see um, without decoupling the process. And it may have unintended consequences. So I hope this was helpful. Um, we teach these type of things in all of our classes from fundamentals um, all the way up through the cover workshop and master motor one and master motor two. So we, we try to tell you what, what all these settings are meant to do versus what we've came to believe they're meant to do. Um, the functions of the machine, the functions of the mold, the four plastics variables. So get a real good base work, a groundwork, uh, for your molding career. And as you train up your employees to your specific operation in your molding shop, thank you and have a good evening.